Thank you very kindly, my friends. As I listen to Ralph Abernathy and his eloquent and generous introduction, and uh, then thought about myself, I wondered who he was talking about. <laughs> It's always good to have your closest friend and associate to say something good about you. And Ralph Abernathy is the best friend that I have in the world. I'm delighted to see each of you here tonight in spite of a storm warning, you reveal that you are determined to go on anyhow. Something is happening in Memphis, something is happening in our world. And you know, if I was standing at the beginning of time with the possibility of taking a kind of general and panoramic view of the whole of human history up to now, and the Almighty said to me, Martin Luther King, which age would you like to live in? I would take my mental flight by Egypt, and I would watch God's children in their magnificent trek from the dark dungeons of Egypt through, or rather across the Red Sea through the wilderness on toward the Promised Land. And in spite of its magnificence, I wouldn't stop there. I would move on by Greece and take my mind to Mount Olympus. And I would see Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, Euripides, and Aristophanes assemble around the Parthenon. And I would watch them around the Parthenon as they discuss the great and eternal issues of reality, but I wouldn't stop there. I would go on even to the great heyday of the Roman Empire. And I would see developments around there through various emperors and leaders. But I wouldn't stop there. I would even come up to the day of the Renaissance and get a quick picture of all that the Renaissance did for the cultural and aesthetic life of man, but I wouldn't stop there. I would even go by the way that the man for whom I'm named had his habitat, and I would watch Martin Luther as he tacked his 95 theses on the door at the Church of Wittenberg, but I wouldn't stop there. I would come on up even to 1863 and watch a vacillating president by the name of Abraham Lincoln finally come to the conclusion that he had to sign the Emancipation Proclamation, but I wouldn't stop there. I would even come up to the early 30s and see a man grappling with the problems of the bankruptcy of his nation and come with an eloquent cry that 
We have nothing to fear but fear itself. But I wouldn't stop there. Strangely enough, I would turn to the Almighty and say, if you allow me to live just a few years in the second half of the 20th century, I will be happy. Now, that's a strange statement to make because the world is all messed up. The nation is sick, trouble is in the land, confusion all around. That's a strange statement. But I know somehow that only when it is dark enough can you see the stars. And I see God working in this period of the 20th century in a way that men in some strange way are responding. Something is happening in our world. The masses of people are rising up, and wherever they are assembled today, whether they are in Johannesburg, South Africa, Nairobi, Kenya, Accra, Ghana, New York City, Atlanta, Georgia, Jackson, Mississippi, or Memphis, Tennessee, the cry is always the same, we want to be free. <laughs> and another reason that I'm happy to live in this period is that we have been forced to a point where we are going to have to grapple with the problems that men have been trying to grapple with through history, but the demands didn't force them to do it. Survival demands that we grapple with them. Men for years now have been talking about war and peace, but now no longer can they just talk about it. It is no longer the choice between violence and nonviolence in this world is nonviolence or non existence. That is where we are today. Is someone here moving toward the twilight of life and fearful of that which we call death? Why be afraid? God is able. Is someone here on the brink of despair because of the death of a loved one, the breaking of a marriage, or the waywardness of a child? Why despair? God is able to give us the power to endure that which cannot be changed. Is someone here anxious because of bad health? Why be anxious? Come what may, God is able. Surely God is able.
Lord God, you keep calling forth light and darkness. It was the first word you spoke in creation. And when Christ came, you called us out of darkness into his marvelous light of grace and love and understanding, justice and solidarity. And so set us as a lamp in the very dark places of the world as witnesses to the God who forgives sin and helps broken and all too human people and create new and living beings from all of the dead places of hate, violence, and domination. And we pray all of these things, O God, in the words that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Hi kids, how are you? We haven't seen each other for a long time, so it's good to see you. You know, one of the things that I was thinking about was that um, there's probably a lot of you that actually hasn't seen the offices here at church. And what I was thinking about was that there are some new things in there that I would, uh, I would like to show you. In fact, when you look around, there's, there is a lot, of, a lot of new things. And so let me take you on a little bit of a, of a tour. So we'll go down the hall here and we'll go into our um, offices. You can see that uh, this is the area where our um, office administrator, our secretary is. And you can see there's a couple of new things. There's uh, the, um, we hung our um, stockings, one for Sadie, one for Francine, which are the dogs. We have a very, very nice uh, card from uh, the Guild of St. Agnes because we had a special lunch time together. This is kind of where Maggie hangs out. And over here actually is a, is a new computer. This is the new financial computer, which is a, uh, it's a godsend because the other one was really very, very old. So I'm glad that we were able to get a, a new one to replace it. And then we go here down into, into my, my office. I think I have a great office. I, I really like it. It's uh, filled with all of my, all of my books and things. And um, I have this uh, nice uh, desk that I, that I bought uh, somewhere and uh, lots of my um, framed pictures and, and things. Uh, my desk here is uh, old, but it is, uh, it is great. It is, um, it is really beautiful. And you can see that this is where I do all of my, um, or a lot of, but at least a lot of the, uh, the filming of our worship services. And so I have some, some screens here and I have my Mac computer, which is where I actually do the, the editing and things. If we go around and you go around this little, little corner, you can see, whoa, wow. Is that beautiful or what? That is a new couch. That is a new couch, which was a gift. It was a gift from the, the Covenant women, which I am very, very grateful for. Um, it's beautiful and uh, it's big enough so that um, one can even take a nap, but I wouldn't know anything about that. So, uh, but it is a great, it is a great new thing. And I kind of reshuffled some of my, um, some of my artwork and things. So that's, that is actually new to, new to me. A couple of uh, things there on my table. Those are not new. However, you could see here that that's my ring light that uh, gives my face a nice, a nice little glow uh, when I am, when I am recording. And that has been 
that has been new too. So the other thing that I was thinking about was that um, I know that you have changed a lot. And here in, uh, for, the, for the, this week, we have some pictures of some babies who were born during the pandemic time. And what I would like from you is that I would like you to send me some pictures of you because I know that you guys grow up so very, very fast. And I'm going to put them in the film for next week or maybe the week after, whatever, depending on how fast you can get them to me because we want to see how much you have grown and how, in some ways, how new you are. So I hope that you will do that. Please do that. And we will see you soon. And I can't wait to see your pictures. Thanks and have a great, great week. Bye-bye. The readings for this third Sunday after, after the Epiphany come to us in the Gospel from the Gospel of John. And then looking in, in the Hebrew Bible, in the book of 1 Samuel, we begin with the Gospel. John chapter 1, starting with verse 43. Jesus is beginning to call his disciples. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee, and he found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. And Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, and Jesus, son of Joseph, from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. And when Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said of him, Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, Where did you get to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered, Do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. And then our second reading comes in the Hebrew Bible. The book of, of 1 Samuel in the, in the third chapter. This is the calling of, of Samuel. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. And the word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his room. The lamp of God had not gone out yet, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called, Samuel, Samuel. And he said, Here I am, and ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call. Lie down again. And so he went and lay down. The Lord called again, Samuel. Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call, my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. And the Lord called Samuel again a third time. And he got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go and lie down. And if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. 
Now the Lord came and stood there, calling, just as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So we begin with photos of three of our kids who were born during the pandemic. We include these three today as a reminder of God's goodness and, and grace. And we do so so that we not forget them and that we get a peek at them before they start high school or get married off, given the length of this viral isolation that we, that we have been in. And so the first picture, the first picture is that of Corey, who was born on Friday, November 6th, 2020, to Mia and Robert Hanna. Grandpa Mitch Sanders reports that Corey has discovered now how to laugh and now has more hair than Mitch. The second is Fox Paul Gustin, already a, already a veteran of the surgical sweep, but now is stronger than ever. Just look at the little smirk that he's giving to, to all of us. He lives down in Florida. He was born to Kevin O'Connell and Jim Carlson's daughter, Bree, and partner, Rory. Third picture is that of Austin, born November 19th, 2020, to Kevin and Rachel Bigelow. And here he is sporting his new Chuck Taylor sneakers for us. Now we include them here because they hint to us the possibility of light. 
new life, grace. They are miraculous gifts of God, and they signal the beginning of, of a new era. The rest of Martin Luther King's statement concerning darkness was, was this. Only, only when there is enough darkness can you see the stars. Only when there is enough darkness. Only when there is enough darkness can you see the little shafts of, of light that are unfolding before us. Sometimes it is only in the dark that we can perceive and sense the very subtle yet profound presence and working of God in our lives. Now, King on that night was delighted to see the people. And he alludes to the blessing of their presence and in spite of a storm warning. And I think if I remember my history right, I think that there was a huge storm that was scheduled for that, that night. Their presence indicated their commitment to go on anyhow. The storm was not just in the weather, but what was going on in the world. Something's happening in Memphis, he said. Something is happening in the world in spite of the darkness. God was still at work. Now, darkness and storm warnings are not just experienced in our present time of, of global pandemic or a massive white supremacist attack on democracy of our nation's capital or on that night of April 3rd, 68, which was the night before King was murdered by yet another raging white man. It also was dark in those days of famine for God's people, which necessitated their, their movement up to, up to Egypt, at which time Pharaoh enslaved them, the whole Hebrew tribe. And much later, the storm warnings hovered over, over Jerusalem in that week that we celebrate now as, as holy. We also learn of dark days as recorded in this third chapter of Samuel. Dark days because contact between God and God's people had gone quiet. One could pick up no chatter between them. The word of God was rare, it says. Visions were not widespread. Now we think sometimes that this, that this story is kind of an idyllic account of childlike faith. And in some ways, I guess that it is. But it also functions as a serious struggle for power. Brueggemann says that the substance of the event is hard, abrasive, and, and devastating. The house of the priest Eli had been promised authority forever, for all of time. Now, that very house would be taken out, punished, forever. The verdict was devastating with no chance of appeal or, or any kind of recourse. And now it would be this young man, Samuel, who would hear the call, take on the call, say yes to the call and exercise the legitimate power of God among the people of Israel. Serious stuff. God does raise up. And God does bring down. Both are true. Now, it wasn't necessarily Eli who was at fault here. It was his sons who presided right alongside Eli. These two, Hophni and Phinehas, they had played easy with God's power, bastardized their, their work to the extent that Eli could not control them any longer. These were dark days. 
God had become silent. No visions. Eli could no longer sense or hear the presence of the presence of God. Change was needed. And Eli knew it. At one time, Eli instructed Samuel. Now Samuel would instruct Eli. Samuel had been dependent on, on Eli to hear, to respond, to learn obedience. Now Eli, through God's authorization of the young one, the old one is now fully dependent on the young, innocent one to be able to hear the Lord. Power had shifted. But the emphasis in the story is not on the dark days, but on the light. Not on the bringing down of one house, Eli, for, for another house. The dark days give way to the breaking light of a new day with obedient Samuel. It was just dark enough so that one could see the stars. Something was happening. Something new was happening in the temple, Shiloh. God was doing something new. There was a chance for newness, a, a fresh start. God was resolved to do a new thing. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Brueggemann makes it plain when he summarizes that this ancient story of Samuel wants to assert that conviction. Behold, I am doing, I am doing a new thing. But that conviction, that conviction had to be born out of crisis. The conviction had to be born out of the darkness of the day. We have been living in dark, dark days, no doubt about it. Our emotions, our spirits, our very beings have been whittled down to the, to the very thinnest of, thinnest of threads. Has Samuel a word for us? Has King a word for us from the Almighty? I think so. I think that the answer is yes. Perhaps the first thing is that every one of us through our baptism is called by the same one who in Shiloh called out in the night, Samuel, Samuel. Every single one of us needs to practice our responsiveness, saying, here I am, I'm here, and I'm listening. This is God calling out to the world. Who knows the newness and fresh starts that we might enjoy if we were only listening to the one who calls us in the night. And secondly, God's emphasis is never in the ending, in the bringing down, in the destructing, in the dismemberment. But God is always, always in the Raising up, the creation of something out of nothing, the remembering, and the chances for newness and new life. Behold, I am doing a very new thing, God says. And to reach back to the gospel today, just come and see. Come and see the new things.
God is doing. In the dark. Come see. Amen.